And we're live. <clears throat> Welcome back to another episode of the MongoDB Podcast Live. My name is Michael Lin. I'm a developer advocate at MongoDB. And today we're going to be talking about how developers learn. So if you're a software developer, you're interested in learning new things, I'm curious, how are you learning today? How do you learn new technologies? How do you learn about new features from products and, and um, how to develop apps in new spaces and new industries? We're going to be talking all about that today. I've got a special guest coming on board. He's founder and CEO of Data Protocol. We'll be introducing him shortly. In the meantime, as you shuffle into the room, let me know who you are, where you're at, where are you joining us from in the world? I'm on the East Coast of the United States, as usual, in a little town called Newtown. I'm curious where you're joining from. I always love to see folks coming in from around the world. Uh, it's always great to see folks checking in from distant places. I like to see who's the furthest person from me on the East Coast of the United States. We'll be getting right into the, the content shortly. We're going to have a demonstration Oh, welcome, Luce Carter. Luce will be watching and moderating the comment stream. Always great to have you on board, Luce. Thank you so much. Welcome, Benson from Ghana. Great to have you on the stream. Orion in New York. I love New York. Spend some time there at the MongoDB headquarters right on Broadway. All right. So... How is it that you as a developer learn? What tools and, and systems are you using? Are you watching videos? Are you reading? Do people still read books? Uh, are you watching videos and developing right along with someone? Uh, that's, that's what interests me today, how you're learning as a developer. So it looks like we're catching up with the folks coming into the room. Sometimes there's a little delay. Welcome. Yeah, it is snowing. Yeah, it's snowing where I'm at too, here in uh, in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Hamid from Toronto. It's great to have you on board. Uh, okay, enough of me talking. Uh, I want to bring our guest in, but before I do, let's talk a little bit about who he is. As I get his bio up, uncomfortably. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> We're gonna have a great discussion with Jake Ward. Jake is founder and CEO of Data Protocol. He's an advocate for developers and a solver of problems. Jake's career began in policy communications, interestingly, and evolved to focus on technology. He finally landed on entrepreneurship. And along the way, Jake developed a zealot-like belief that with the right tools and enough time, any challenge could be overcome. Data Protocol is the realization of that conviction. Jake is a graduate of Wheaton College and Northeastern University, the co-founder and former CEO, president of the Application Developers Alliance, a co-founder of Caddy Now, and chairman of the Connected Commerce Council. Let's bring Jake in. Jake, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Michael. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as I talked about when uh, we were warming up the stream, we're going to be talking about how developers learn. And uh, at Data Pro Protocol, that's something that you focus on, right? Tell folks a little it bit is. about Data Protocol and, and about your background. Sure, sure. So um, Data Protocol is a platform designed to enable developers to learn anything quickly and at scale. But it's also there to help companies that depend on developers that invest in them and, and rely on them for success. Think about your Facebooks, your your Snap, even Ngrok and AppRite. Companies who mm. are developer first is what we think about them. It's helping them reach and engage and support those developers at scale. Uh, as I, I heard you ticking down my, my uh, life's journey through my career it's a little bit of a this is your life game show but it was interesting because i i did i started in politics and communications but I, I pretty quickly transitioned into this world of sort of tech advocacy and communications which then led to developers specifically software designers and builders and how they engage the world the value of them as a workforce both to us as consumers but also to the economy overall and to specific technologies and I had been struck even as long ago as 2012 when I started the Application Developers Alliance 
with the realization that even the people who were most invested in their success didn't necessarily understand how to communicate with them and that too often they were commoditizing that workforce uh, and missing opportunities. And then in the wake of Cambridge Analytica and some of the uh, data, the new oil controversies of the past 10 years, what we have realized is that developers are just like any other craftsman. They want to do a good job. They want to be successful as business people, but also as, as creators. And Data Protocol sets out to give them the tools that they need the way that they mm. want. Mm. So what sets Data Protocol apart from uh, some of the tools that developers are, are kind of finding on their own today? Yeah, and so Data Protocol in, in reality is a web app. Right, it's a it's mm -hmm. a way for developers to log in, take a look at uh, content, usually video. Eighty three percent of working developers say that video is how they prefer to get information about the products they use, about the resources they need. But we also have sort of a software enabled uh, video platform that I'll I'll show you in a few minutes that opens up a world of more interactive, more intuitive dev docs, as well as guides that deliver value more quickly to get developers back to doing what they came to do in the first place, which is build cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. So going from public commu policy communications to technology, how did you land on on this space? Like, why this space? Why en enabling developers? Yeah. So I I worked for Olympia Snow, who's a senior senator from Maine, two thousand six two thousand seven during the first net neutrality fight, in which Google was a prominent participant, and it was really the first time that Washington D.C. and federal policymakers realized how important Silicon Valley was going to be. It was also the first time Silicon Valley realized how important Washington and D.C. was going to be. And so in the wake of that uh, nine-month battle where I spent a lot of time talking to companies that were educating me about the nature of digital technology and the Internet, I realized that that's sort of what I wanted to do for a living is being in that space. And, and 2010, 2011, I worked with Google and Intel on the first Google TV which was the predecessor to all the smart TVs that we're plugged into right now, right? It's the idea of putting Android in the back half of a plasma TV. But the first prototype was this clunky keyboard, really rough experience that tried to aggregate digital signals and put them all in a single menu. Now we just call that television, but that's what it looked like 10, 12 years, 14 years ago. And mm -hmm. That's a long way of saying in that process, one of the things that I was asked to do was consider how to engage large swaths of developers to build a killer app that would bring people to the idea of a smart television. We didn't get there. I think it took eight more years to get off the shelf, et cetera, et cetera. But that experience brought me to this, this realization that even Google didn't know where these guys were. And so there was a, there was a moment where it was clear to me that application developers particularly, but all software engineers generally needed a better um, bridge to policy issues as well as a functional bridge to their partners, right? Not their employers necessarily, but certainly their partners, the people whose tools they try, whose services they use, and whose resources they depend on. So as you tackle this challenge, building a platform to enable developers, what are some of the gaps that you looked to address with within uh, the developer community and developer relations in general? I mean, there's there's three that come to mind right off the top of my head. Right, the the first one is the is the nature of developer relations. Developer support has changed dramatically as that workforce increased. Ten years ago, fifteen years ago, and Twilio was sort of the rising star of developer relations when Linda Smith was out there and Keith Casey and um, and those guys, Rob Spector, were out there doing hackathons, track jackets and chucks, showing people how to put short codes in their apps. That's the grassroots nature of, of developer advocacy and, and building things from that level. It doesn't work anymore because it doesn't scale, right? That costs way too much money. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard for a startup particularly to take that bet when there's so much noise in that space. So one of the things that I pretty quickly realized is that developers still want that kind of attention. It's just not available to them, particularly as you get off of the, the highest level of partners, right? You know, your Air France's and your Bank of America, anybody below that is going to find a hard time uh, with, with a toll-free uh, toll number to call for customer support. 
And so I wanted to take the passion and the experience and the expertise of every developer relations, developer advocate I've ever met and put them in an asynchronous environment where they could have this kind of conversation and fix your problem. So if I'm a developer that keeps encountering a problem, the first thing I do is I Google it. Is anybody else having this challenge? And if I end up on Stack Overflow, I can get yelled at a little bit and maybe get an answer. If I can go to Reddit <laughs> and get, you know, sort of sort down through it. Eventually I might end up on the dev docs of the company whose tool I'm trying to use. And then I'm command Fing my way through the document to see if I can find the answer. I wanted to skip all of that and just put it in one place where you just, okay, there it is. And the person says, if you're encountering this problem, here is your solution. Did this work? Okay, carry on with your day. I don't want you to spend all day on the platform. I don't want you to take 15 courses or three short codes and take an assessment and earn a badge every day. I want you to come look for an answer to a question. And so we work with partners, an increasing number of companies, big and small, to take their dev docs and their lessons and their expertise from their developer evangelists and put them in the box, right? Put them on screen in the platform. So bring dev docs to life, the, the passion and experience of those folks in an asynchronous on-demand way. And the third one is metrics. I'm sure we're gonna talk about this a little bit today, but without those metrics, people can't defend what they do for a living, right? A developer advocate that, or developer relations lead that says, I went to this many events, and this is how we're doing, isn't able to connect those dots for their boss or their boss's boss. You need to be able to say, the lifetime value of a developer that enters my funnel is X. That is a return <laughs> on investment of X plus, and that's why my salary is not a cost center. I deliver value to this organization. But too often, because developer relations, developer advocacy is in marketing rather than product or sales, we look at it as a cost center and we're, we're not being able to align the metrics in the way that we need to. So I built this thing with metrics, touch points everywhere from engagement, performance, sentiment. And I'll say to potential partners, if you had five minutes with your entire developer network and you knew everybody was listening, what would you tell them? Then what would you ask them? That's what we enable. That's what we sought out to do. And I think we're getting there. Yeah. Well, this is the world I live in. As a developer advocate, <clears throat> I know I know what you said is absolutely true. No longer can we just show up at a conference and and talk to people and hope that hope that we have an impact. And I, I just attended a, a meeting where leadership talked about the the difference between being busy and having an impact. And it's so critical today that that we can not only you know have have activities taking place but be able to measure those and, and be able to measure the impact on the business. So I, I found a quote uh, earlier today, and it, it, I think it's Jermaine. Tell me and I forget, teach me and I may remember, involve me and I learn. And that's from Benjamin Franklin. So I wanna throw that out there and, and see how that resonates with you. And, and does it resonate with data protocol? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that one of the things that I set out to do in the early, early days of designing this product, but now every day with my teams, is that the empathy of how we feel about a developer going to work every day and looking for answers has to be felt in every course, in every pixel, in every corner of this platform. The empathy with the user, with the end user who isn't our customer, right? The content is entirely free on platform. Developers are not our customers. They're the mm -hmm. users of the platforms. They're the people we are trying to reach and support. They're the barometer by which we measure success. Our customers mm -hmm. are the platforms and the companies that are already invested in, in supporting and, and reaching and engaging those developers. But the developers are how I measure whether or not we did a good job. Yeah. Well, and so when we, when we built, I'll show you in a second, but when we built this, mm. we, we thought about what do developers want to see? What do they want to do? Hands-on keyboards, right? Six out of every 10 developers don't use a mouse, right? They just, their hands are on the keys. They're flying around with, with function tabs. Okay, so how do we make this maneuverable without the mouse being a core dependency? How do we make this so that it's not corporate training, which sucks? How do we make it so it doesn't feel like training at all? And you'll see when you mm -hmm. look at the UX, and I encourage anybody listening, just, just go to the site, log in, it's quick SSO, it's an easy hit. But the, the um, the barometer by which I measure our design is universally when a developer looks at it, I want them to know it's for them. 
right? Their face lights up and says, that, that's not like anything I've ever seen before. That's for me. That's, that's mm -hmm. the goal. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you've wet my appetite and I'm sure the folks that are, that are watching and listening are, uh, are, are tuned in, ready to see what data protocol is all about. Are you ready to, to give us a, a tour? I am with, with the caveat that I am absolutely not here to shill for the platform or its use, but I would love to get people's feedback. Uh, any courses you take, any, any features or functions, hit me up on Twitter at Jacob M. Ward or email me, Jake at Data Protocol. I really, I want your feedback. Uh, if it's really good advice, I'm going to pass it off as my own, just so we're clear. I'm going to take credit for it, and we'll move on from there. But it, this is an open forum. Uh, my experience is that developers like to build really cool stuff and tell other people they're wrong. And so I'm I'm hopeful that I can I can tap into some of that passion. Yeah. All right. Well, without further ado, let's uh, let's take a peek. Okay. Great. So uh, this is the landing page of the web app. Uh, what you can see here is it's got kind of a, a cool Netflix for developers vibe to it. Uh, we built this to be a simple SSO login. Working with our partners, we can integrate SAMLs, other SSOs. But the gist of it is every person who comes here and wants to take courses creates an account. This is where I, I'd say over and over again, we don't want PII. We don't care about it. We just need some way to make sure that we're aligning your notes and resources across the board. So you can see here, we've got these hero image up top, lots of courses that we're featuring, some of the check stuff. Uh, I'm going to show you the functionality of this thing real quick. I'm going to click into Slack. This is a course that we did with Katie Miller from Slack not that long ago, announcing their next generation platform. Now, I'm going to mute her so that she's not talking over me. Uh, and I'm going to hit play on this. So this is Katie telling us about next generation platform for Slack as they were rolling out to promote this, uh, this new tool set. You can see the fly-ins up here on the top right. And this is when developers tend to go, oh, that's different. This CLI that we have over here enables us to ask questions, to answer questions, collect data. We also drop in these notes down here. Now, let me click on this fly-in real quick. And what you'll see, oh, actually, you're not going to see it because it just dropped to the other one. I'm going to share this tab instead. Okay, so that brings me over here, uh, which allows me to link out and extend Slack's developer experience. Right, We're not trying to replace necessarily we're trying to extend the work that they were already doing. Uh, all right, let's see if I can do this without breaking it. Uh, da -da -da. Nope, broke it. Okay. Um, Michael, zip me back over to the platform, if you don't mind, if you can do that. Uh, let's see. Because I'm, I'm not being able to get out of here. Um, oh, okay. Right, let me do that. Yeah, maybe just re represent. Yep, I'm gonna yeah. pull back in so that I'm back on platform here real quick. Um, mm -hmm. So what we do, like I said, when we pull that in, we're extending the experience from Slack's existing documentation so that we, there we go, so that we are, uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, right? We're taking all of the hard work that they've done and we're extending it into our audience, our growing developer base, but also into a new format. One of the other things you're going to see here is these notes, right? Each of these pre-filled notes is a key takeaway from the course that she's teaching. Now, if I click on uh, any one of these notes, we, we lost it'll you. take me. We lost, your, oh, we lost your screen. That's weird. Uh, Unshared. That is. Yeah, this is a challenge. <laughs> this is a challenge with StreamYard. Oh. Sometimes it's a, a little tricky to get the present presentation down, but. Uh, we'll add it back. Yeah, let's try that again. Okay. Is that working? Yeah, I think it has to do with um, when you choose to share what you're sharing. Yeah, and maybe. I think, okay. Yeah. We're back. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So back here on the homepage, let me also show you those pre-filled notes that we're dropping in on the bottom of the screen show up mm -hmm. here. So for every course that I've taken, the pre-filled notes or any notes that I've taken for that matter, are timestamped. So if I come down to this org verification course and I, oh, what's this interesting thing that I need to get the context around, it takes me back into the course mm -hmm. so that I am taking ostensibly an open book test, right? I'm able to find the context of the note and the information and all of the resources associated with it. Um, the 
let me show you this real quick. For MetaQuest, we backend their Trusted Developer Essentials program. So they have a full channel. These are all of the courses, all of the resources, the short codes and guides, all of these pieces that we've built for them that they integrate into their onboarding process for thousands and thousands of developers. Again, I'm gonna mute this real quick and play. And then I'm also gonna speed Steve up a little bit, which I know every developer loves. <laughs> so the CLI comes over here. This is short code. The whole thing is like a minute and 22 seconds long, right? But when we yep. speed them up, we're gonna get through this in 47 seconds. All the notes are popping up here. And then we also ask questions down here on the side. That question enables partners to check in, both to see if you're engaged, if you get the answers you wanted, how you feel about a product or a feature, but it also gives you an opportunity as a developer to tell your partners what you need. So we, this can be any, we call them sentiments and knowledge checks are the two things that we can, we can use this CLI for. There is a number of use cases, actually, our work with Intel, we turned the course log on. We aim it at a, at a virtual machine. We bounce it. We can run actual computation side by side with the video. But the gist of this, a lot of people say, so it's an LMS for developers. I say, well, if it's an LMS, it's built by developers for developers. But really what it is mm. is a, an engagement platform, right? Because you can ask any of these questions to prove proficiency, but you can also gather feedback. And then up here, whenever we change a course or add a link or drop in a new piece of information, this notification buzzer goes off for anybody who's ever taken that course. So now you're in a dialogue. As a company, I'm, I'm changing an API, I'm deprecating something or I'm adding a feature. This notification goes off so that anybody in my audience gets this alarm bell that you should fix this before it breaks, which is often the case. And by then it's far too late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the end user of this, the customer partners, also have access to all of the data that comes from this. Again, it's not individualized because we don't care what your first or last name is, but it is aggregated. So anybody that comes through the Slack channel, Slack gets a, gets a readout of 1,700 developers this month went through. This was their engagement, their proficiency based on what you asked them. These are the things that they clicked on. Now you can reconcile that conversion into new Slack API users or breakage around a specific point that we addressed in the course and or for MetaQuest, we also add badges so that if you take four or five courses in, a, in sequence, we know that you know how to handle data and that you know how to do a privacy policy and you know how to survive their DDUP. So you are recognized as more proficient than somebody who's just walking in off the street. Hmm. Well, on first glance, Jake, this looks very deep. So this is very different from what I think developers today are leveraging. Like you called it out, like I'll Google, I'll hit stack, stack overflow, stack exchange. I might or might not find answers. I might hit Reddit. And, and I'm basically on my own translating information that exists in the repository of the web to the problem I'm trying to solve. But what you've shown me here is it is video content. There is instruction involved, but I'm in the platform. This seems pretty deep. Like in order for you to be able to present this, this content, you need to, to not only prepare the, the spoken word, the video content, but also launch a, a mini environment where the developer gets a CLI. Um, I mean, that's, that's groundbreaking. Thank you. Uh, the hard part I think is done. <laughs> frankly but uh mm. the 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 secret sauce is the partnership between the company and my content team so data protocol mm. content team is run is is led by instructional designers one instructional designer with a team of designers that then is back ended by directors animators producers the folks that build the content so what you're mm. seeing is actually entirely scripted by us, filmed by us, animated, produced, and hosted by us. Our goal when we work with a partner is to say, what challenge are you trying to solve? We'll mm -hmm. take care of the rest. Uh, there are many companies that are using video effectively on YouTube and even on, in their own environments. We've taken that and, and sort of pumped it up a little bit. Right? The, the idea of bringing a dev doc to life by putting it on video is 
interesting, not revolutionary. The idea of asking questions alongside those dev docs and being able to measure eyeline and where the points of engagement are and what that network effect is longitudinally, that's a faster car. Not that's a car, not faster horses. Right. The mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. hard part of this was building the platform to do all of those pieces. So that part's done. Now it's a matter of iterating and adding features to meet the needs of the developer as well as the partner. And then adding content. We have uh, at least 25 more courses coming in the next four months, three months, mm -hmm. three months. Um, and, and, and we'll be ramping throughout the year, right? There'll be hundreds of pieces of content on platform in, over the next seven months. Yeah. There's nothing more important for a developer to be on the edge, to learn new technologies faster. So I'm curious, like you, you talked about going from a horse to a car, like this platform is the car. What's... What's next in the evolution of data protocol? Um, our goal actually is to <laughs> add a little bit of um, of a widget over the next year, probably, where you could just install a, a piece on your desktop so that when your partners that you've gone through and check boxes, I use these six APIs, this, this um, ad network, and these platforms, these two SDKs I need to keep an eye on, you get notifications whenever something pops into that task bar. So it's more of a uh, more of a push than a pull. That's our long term roadmap. And if my, my head of product heard me say that he'd throw a book at me right now. But in the immediate, it's to it's to improve the metric component of this so that the dashboard is more readily available to our partners and unlocks insights for them. Uh, yeah. You can imagine, for example, one of the one of the key pieces that we see, but partners are a little incredulous around is that if you have your dev docs or you have any sort of blog that links to a dev doc that goes to a video at any point in that process you can't track outcome but if you do that inside data protocol what you can what you can do is have attributable metrics earlier because you have to sign in so we know not necessarily your name but who you are as you go through this path then you can mm -hmm. reconcile that account with breakage or with why you left, why you churned out, or a positive outcome. Then you can reverse engineer that process and say, okay, if we reach more people earlier in the funnel with this information, they are more likely to use our product without churn or breakage. That increases the, the LTV, skyrockets the ROI, and makes your marketing significantly more efficient. Till pretty recently, you couldn't even imagine putting those metrics together to form any sort of index we can do it in a matter of hours. Mm, impressive. So I see some of the partners that you've worked with to date. I see Slack, I see Meta, some, some very well-known uh, platforms that developers are interested in working with. Um, I'm curious about the surface area and how developers that are watching today might begin to, to leverage some of the content that's available. Now, obviously they can go to data protocol and, and consume it, but when you work with a partner, do they have the ability to embed uh, what's produced by data protocol in their own platforms? So we ask them, we, we go through and do an inventory of, of their promotional channels and how they're communicating already. And we look for ways to integrate GIFs, short, short forms, sizzle reels, things that enable uh, sort of the, the contextual transfer. But in order to hit, in order to do the thing where we're gathering data, showing the engagement and collecting the resources, it's got to be on platform. Now, the there are some companies that say we'd really like people to not leave our environment, to which I say, if you keep doing what you've done, you're going to keep getting what you've got. If you're happy with that, why are we having this conversation? They have to leave your platform in order to engage a different way of gathering resources of watching video of, of entering information. But more importantly, they want a resource like this that looks sort of the video version of Reddit or Stack or even uh, Google for that matter. They don't want to live and die in your dev docs where they've already spent mm -hmm. too much time. Mm. Yeah. And I see uh, our friend Sean Falconer of Skyflow. He's the best. <laughs> he is great. He's been on the podcast. <laughs> Skyflow, amazing platform. 
it was great. We uh, yeah. we built a, a fun short code with with Sean that uh, is sort of priming the top of the funnel for those guys. They do a tremendous job marketing across the board, but our membership base, which uh, certainly started with more of a privacy bent than not because of some of mm. our early content, has mm -hmm. really taken to this to these courses. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, it's great to see the platform. It looks like it's it's dynamite. I'm, I'm looking forward to to checking out the content that's been prepared so far. If you're watching the live stream and you've got questions, now's the time to put them in the chat. Let us know. Jake, what else do we need to know about data protocol? Uh, I think the key for, for your listeners particularly is to remember that it's free for developers, that there is a lot more content coming. You saw some of the, the larger companies that we've been fortunate enough to work with that's sort of the byproduct of what I used to do for a living. But the the vast majority of content on platform is going to come from mid to early stage companies over the next year, right? We're really mm -hmm. ramping up. We're launching with Circle, I think next week with their first short code, which is really exciting. We're talking to AppRite about bringing some of their stuff to life, um, working with Ngrok to look at their content pieces. We want to be we want to be helpful any way we can to companies that clearly care about developers, right? I, mm. I fight this fight frequently, and I, I suspect we're about to talk about it, that there's a commoditization around developers where they you can't, can't effectively filter who's great and who's a problem so everybody gets lumped into the same basket and they sort of sift their way to the bottom anyway. That's not optimal mm. it's not optimal for the workforce or the product or the customers it's not a good business model but it's the best that many had anybody who wants to do better we want to work with and we were actually just running the numbers this morning the cost for production for hosting for distribution on data protocol is about half of what it is on average for the production of any video that's going to end up on youtube or even on your site with uh, like we've covered significantly less function and value mm -hmm. that's that's pretty incredible i mean so half the cost and and all of those extra features like short codes and engagement and that's pretty incredible yeah i mean part of it's that this is what we do for a living right the the efficiency of scale that comes from mm -hmm. doing this uh as i'm talking to you right now two doors down there's a shoot going on in our studio where we're, we're gonna churn through some different content and a few videos and some promotional stuff. If you're a software company, you shouldn't also be a production company. That That's crazy, mm -hmm. right? We have the, we have built this platform because half of the business is around platform as a service, but the idea is software enabled video. And so the other piece mm -hmm. of what we do is build really cool stuff. Yeah. Well, well while I have you, Jake, you're on the forefront of developer enablement, launching data protocol is an amazing platform. There's so much happening in this space, AI and, and uh, compliance challenges. I'm curious, as a leader in this space, what does the future of software development look like to you? It's a really interesting question. I think that, I think software development as a, as a industry is a lot like medicine. Right. There's there's all the subsets. So dentists don't care about the same thing as podiatrists and so on and so on. But there is sort of this overarching thing. It's like point of sale. What do you do with advertising? What how are you managing records? Like all of that is ubiquitous and pervasive across the discipline. So if you're a if you're a software engineer who works at any number of forty thousand companies just in the US and you've got a commute to work and a 401k and like this is part of your job you're not going to change much, right? There's some tech debt you got to deal with. There's an architect and there's an IT department and a CIO. And they, like, that's, that's part of the thing. But if you're part of the other 29 million software developers in, in the world, and you've got to figure out what's coming next and how do I use ChatGPT and what does Copilot look like? I think that what we're finding is that what we know, and this goes back to your Franklin quote, actually, is developers learn by trial and error. That's what they mm -hmm. do. They are, they, they're, puzzle, uh, um, they put the puzzles pieces together over and over and over again until they can finally create a picture. That's how applications of all sizes are built. Yes, they become best practices. Yes, we can scale on top of things. And then there's the, 
plug and play, just move these things and then go over the top. And the containers really help with that. But the next rung of innovative software development is going to happen in AI space, certainly AR, VR, sort of the XR world in which we live. But most of it is going to happen on an enterprise level. The B2B stuff is going to continue to pay the bills of the vast majority of software developers in this country and around the world. And so the question is how fast that's going to go, right? We mm. know that uh, making these systems talk to each other and thinking about use cases beyond being able to walk down the street and play Vision Pro, right? What does that look like at an enterprise level? And how do you sell that into industries that are going to be churning with a lot of um, convulsing almost more than churning, right? With a lot of uncertainty, particularly in this time when money's not free anymore and it's hard mm -hmm. to raise capital. And so B2C startups are going to start banging into walls pretty hard and everything's going to be about B2B, but it's that SaaS PLG model is going to, is going to rust a little, if not die completely as we get through the next five years. And so more products that are jumping past beta because they are ready for enterprise um, use and implementation are going to lead the way. They're going to be more successful. Yeah. Any advice for the developers just trying to stay ahead of the curve? Um, I don't think developers need to be encouraged to learn new stuff, right? I think as a general mm -hmm. rule that that's part of the gig. They are they are feeding themselves already. What I would mm -hmm. what I would urge companies that are developer dependent to adopt is an attitude that has to evolve. This idea of of go fast, fail fast, break stuff, uh, put it out there, let's find out. That's going to change as the stakes get higher and higher. You mentioned compliance earlier. Anything that comes within a country mile of data can't go fast and break things anymore. They will put you out of business and make sure you stay there. <laughs> and that a lot of what we try to do on data protocol is to give developers the tools they need just to navigate GDPR and, and state-based regulations and DSARs and just sort of the quick hit, here's the five things you need to know. We're not going to, we're not lawyers. We're not trying to teach anybody how to like comply. We're just saying, mm. have you thought of this kind of stuff? Those resources exist and more and more of them are coming because the stakes are getting higher and higher. What I would encourage, again, the developers individually are fine. They will stay at the forefront of all of this. That's part and parcel of doing their job. It's the companies that invest in them and depend on them and employ them have to also institute that attitude as a, as a protocol for engaging the world. Mm. Well said. Well, Jake, I want to thank you for joining me today. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap up? Uh, sign up, check it out. Again, every course on there is free. I'd love to get your feedback. Also keep an eye on it. There's uh, at least two coming next week and maybe as many as seven more in the little bit and a bunch of interactive dev doc stuff that we're about to launch. It's a template that I'm incredibly excited about where we're using decision trees and questions and answers rather than sort of left side navigation command F your way through it. And if it mm. catches on, I hope to sort of revolutionize the way that we're, we're presenting dev docs. Developers yeah. deserve better than what we're giving them right now. Absolutely. All right, Jake. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michael. I'll talk to you soon. Have a great Appreciate day. It. Yep.